Good morning. Welcome to the Global Taiwan Institute's virtual seminar on social movements and identity politics in Hong Kong and Taiwan. Uh, my name is Jennifer Chang. I'm a research fellow at GTI and I have the pleasure of moderating today's event. The Global Taiwan Institute is a think tank located in Washington, D.C. that focuses on Taiwan policy and research, and its mission is to enhance U.S. Taiwan relations. GTI holds a regular public seminar series that discusses timely and salient topics on Taiwan's domestic issues, U.S. Taiwan relations, and Taiwan's relations with the world. Due to the current pandemic, our seminar series have now moved online. This webinar could not have come at a more opportune time. Recent developments in Hong Kong, including China's passage of a national security law for Hong Kong and the postponement of the city's legislative elections have cast a chilling effect on Hong Kong society. And they have also raised concerns about the future of Hong Kong's autonomy and democratic freedoms. Taiwan is closely watching these developments in Hong Kong because while Taiwan, while Hong Kong civil society is resisting mainlandization, Taiwan is resisting Hong Kongization. That is turning Taiwan into another Hong Kong. When Taiwan's Foreign Minister Joseph Wu recently met with U.S. Health Secretary Alex Azar in Taipei, Wu said, quote, our life has become increasingly difficult as China continues to pressure Taiwan into accepting its political conditions, conditions that will turn Taiwan into the next Hong Kong. Um, there has been much policy discussion on Taiwan's policies towards Hong Kong and the trajectory of cross-strait relations. Today's event slices into these issues by focusing on social movements and identity formation, two mutually reinforcing processes that have affected Taiwan, Hong Kong, China relations. Taiwan's social movement has impacted that of Hong Kong and vice versa. In recent years, we've seen enhanced transporter linkages and communication between social activists in Hong Kong and Taiwan. Today's event will focus on the connection between social movements in Hong Kong and Taiwan and how recent Chinese moves on Hong Kong have impacted Hong Kong civil society, including academic and press freedom. Uh, we invite our virtual audience members to submit questions for our keynote speaker and panelists, whom I will introduce shortly, and you can send in questions through the duration of this event. Uh, questions can be sent through the chat function on our YouTube page or by email to contact at Taiwan, globaltaiwan.org. Um, well, we are honored to have legislator Freddie Lim, who is joining us from Taipei. Um, he has graciously offered to provide the opening keynote to kick off this event. Mr. Lim is an independent member of Taiwan Legislative Yuan and is an outspoken advocate of human rights, Hong Kong, Tibet, as well as a number of social issues in Taiwan. From 2010 to 2014, he served as chairman of Amnesty International in Taiwan. He also founded the New Power Party in 2015, entered the Legislative UN in 2016, and served on the Foreign and National Defense Committee in the Legislative UN. He is also the lead vocalist of the Taiwanese heavy metal band Tonic. Thank you very much for being here with us today, Mr. Lin, and I'll now turn it over to you. Uh, hello, thank you, Haas and fellow speakers and people uh, who are watching the live stream. I'm very glad to be invited to participate in today's GTI online forum. Focusing on today's theme, Hong Kong and Taiwan's democratic and social movement development. As chairman of Taiwan Parliament Group for Hong Kong, I'm here to share some of my observations. Let me share some context of Hong Kong and Taiwan's demo uh, democratic movement. I think today we focus on after the handover of Hong Kong after 1997, the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region uh, government's policies are heavily uh, tilled towards the industrial and commercial sectors. The deep connections, or some call the collusion between government and business, create uh, various social and economic problems. The cause of this is actually rooted in a, a contradiction rising from Hong Kong's stronger uh, political and economic ties with China. All of these fuels Hong Kong people's calling for a democratic reform, like dual universal suffrage, 
uh, real universal suffrage, Zheng Puxian. They want a Hong Kong ruled by Hong Kong people from the bottom up, bottom up instead of letting Beijing control Hong Kong politics from the top down. From the umbrella movement in 2014, the fishbowl movement in 2016 to last year's anti-ELAB movement, uh, which is anti-extradition law amendment bill movement, which one is more intense than the, uh, each one is more intense than the last. And they also get more attention from the world. About the same two decades ago, Taiwan held its first presidential election in 1996 and Taiwan's democracy has been uh, solidified after multiple fair elections and party alterations. However, China has also been an uh, unavoidable core issue in Taiwan's election. Although Taiwan and Hong Kong have different status, different courses of democratic movements, we share the same factors influencing our political development which is oppression from China and the interaction effect with international situations. If we have to compare Hong Kong and Taiwan, I think Hong Kong's stage of democratic development is quite like that of Taiwan in the 80s, 1980s. Back then, Taiwan was under the authoritarian control of the KMT, but opportunities for democratic movements had started to emerge. In Taiwan's case, uh, externally, the KMT government was expelled from the United Nations in 1971. The U.S. established di uh, diplomatic ties with China in 1979. The ROC regime that KMT established in Taiwan was isolated in the international community. Internally, then President Jiang Jingguo's health had uh, declined and his control had loosened. KMT was plagued with factional struggle. So movement for democratization started to grow and thrive in the shadow of Chinese authoritarian regimes oppression. Hong Kong situation was given a glimpse of hope from China's growing tension in international relations. But I think it's still hard to say Hong Kong's situation will follow the same path as Taiwan. Uh, after all, the Chinese Communist Party is very different from the KMT back then. So uh, after Chinese economic reform, uh, capital from foreign countries, including Western democracy, started to pour in China. They hope China's economic uh, liberalization would eventually turn into its political democratization. After China acquired great economic power, it didn't turn its way to freedom and democracy. Instead, they want to dominate the world. They want to be the rule maker. Uh, this intention was clarified after Xi Jinping rose to power in 2012. She advocates uh, socialism with Chinese, so-called socialism with Chinese characteristics for a new era or Xi thoughts. The CCP infiltrates international organizations to alter the rules. They promote One Belt, One Road uh, initiative and Chinese propaganda to the world, attempting to make the entire world go along with their playbook. At the same time, China has tightened its uh, grasp on Hong Kong. 20 years after the handover, Chris Patton, the last governor of Hong Kong, told the British media that uh, increasing signs in indicate Beijing has tightened its control and suppression of Hong Kong after she took power. So the State Council of China published a white paper on Hong Kong and uh, its impacts on one country, two system on June 10th, 2014. Since then, China has been uh, sabotaging its promise of two systems. This break of promise was officially committed in Ju July after the passing of Hong Kong national security law. So they start to arrest Hong Kong pro-democracy activists with unwarranted charges. More than a million people went on the street during last year's anti-ELAB uh, movement which gained international attention. 
When Beijing passed Hong Kong national security law, the U.S. House of Representatives responded with Hong Kong Autonomy Act. The U.K., Canada, Australia, uh, New Zealand, Germany, and France have announced the suspension of extradition agreements with Hong Kong, one after another. Last month, the Trump administration revoked Hong Kong's special status with Hong Kong Autonomy Act and Hong Kong Human Rights and Democracy Act. It also sanctioned 11 officials who damaged Hong Kong's autonomy, including four Chinese officials and chief executive of Hong Kong, Carrie Lam. Besides using hard measures to sanction China, members of the Five Eyes, including the US, the UK, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand, have taken action to support Hong Kong people. The US Congress passed Hong Kong Safe Harbor Act to grant Hong Kong people priority to political asylum. The UK, Australia, and Canada have uh, respectively announced to extend visas for Hong Kong people or even establish ways to, for them to acquire permanent residency. After the global impact of uh, COVID-19 pandemic, the current international situation has taken clear shape the major confrontation between Western uh, democratic countries led by the U.S. and China. Foreign policy of democratic countries might change after elections, but China continues to show its expanding uh, ambition. From the South China Sea, Sino-Indian border, Hong Kong to Taiwan, China has been consist, uh, constant, constantly creating problems in the Asia-Pacific region. This confrontation is bound to continue developing. Right now, Taiwan should not and cannot face the Hong Kong problem alone. So we are cooperating with like-minded democratic countries to support Hong Kong. There are two major directions to realize our support. First, we need to strengthen our defense and sanction towards China. Second, we need to stand in uh, solidarity with Hong Kong's uh, pursuit for, uh, of democracy and provide uh, substantial help for Hong Kong people in Taiwan. So on one hand, Taiwan's Ministry of the Interior is enacting laws to reinforce the management of people from Hong Kong, Macau, that have deep ties with China. The goal, the goal is to prevent Chinese citizens conducting acts of infiltration, uh, unification, harassment or uh, a spawnage in Taiwan by acquiring Hong Kong or Macau residency. And on the other hand, under President Tsai's orders, Taiwan's mainland affairs, con Taiwan's mainland affairs council established. Actually, I, I think this should be a foreign affairs issue. So anyway, <laughs> established Taiwan Hong Kong service and communication office. It's a specialized uh, li uh, liaison integrating different so social resources to substantially support Hong Kong people's staying and living uh, livelihood in Taiwan. In the current situation, Hong Kong's democratic movement is forced to halt temp temporarily. Some of the iconic pro-democracy figures either escape overseas or quit their organizations China crea uh, creates an atmosphere of terror by conducting mass arrest. arrest. However, its uh, intolerance to any uh, dissent actually shows the weakness of its region. region. If its people obtain just a little bit of freedom, it shall crumble and fall. Hong Kong situation right now is kind of like Taiwan's white terror period, the darkest time before the end of martial law. A lot of political work can only operate underground. They have to prepare for long-term struggles. However, I always try my best to stay optimistic. After all, not just Taiwan, there are so many countries that experience the struggle against dictatorship before acquiring democracy and freedom. So I believe with the uh, pers uh, perse persever perseverance and courage of the Hong Kong people and the support from the international community, Hong Kong's dem uh, democratic movement can uh, auto automatically reach its goal.
let's look at look back to Taiwan. Taiwan might be a rather stable democratic country, but as long as China, the closest and biggest threat to our country, doesn't give up its ambition towards us, our government and democratic institutions can't truly normalize. It's impossible for us to let our guard down. Facing the authoritarian China, Taiwan has to be a beacon of hope for the oppressed. We need to unite the democratic countries all around the world to support the oppressed people of Hong Kong, even Xinjiang and Tibet. So I think that's why we are having this meeting today, because we want to unite more people. We want to inspire, encourage more people, no matter online or offline. Let's work even harder. And I'm, I, I will always stay optimistic. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Legislator Lim, for your remarks. Um, we've seen slogans um, um, in Taiwan and Hong Kong that use uh, reference points to each other. So we've seen slogans such as today Hong Kong, tomorrow Taiwan. Um, how do you see the interconnections between Taiwan and Hong Kong social movements? And how have Taiwanese activists inspired or contributed to Hong Kong social movements, um, such as the Sunflower Movement's impact on Hong Kong's um, various um, anti-China protests? Mm. Uh, like I said before, the deep cause of Taiwan and Hong Kong's social movement are both rooted in China. We reject China's annex section. They are in pursuit, pursuit of democracy. So it's normal for us to inspire and influence each other. And in fact, Taiwan and Hong Kong have actively supported each other in their uh, respectively, uh, respective social movement. During the period of NTELAB movement, there were also a huge amount of Hong Kong young people came to Taiwan participating and supporting our election. I, I, I remember there, there uh, were a bunch of Hong Kong people been to my campaign, my uh, my rally during my uh, before the election in this uh, January, and they they have been so passionate and want to be a part of democracy and want to learn more from Taiwan through the campaigns. I'm still so impressed and deeply moved by them. So I think uh, uh, Taiwan and Hong Kong will inspire uh, each other and, and strengthen the relations in the near future continually. Thank you. Um, you've engaged um, scores of young people, you know, both at your concerts and also as a politician. Um, I was wondering if you can tell us how would you characterize Taiwan's young people and in their political activism? Um, <laughs> uh, 应该是说怎么去形容台湾的年轻人，对不对？对，他的观点。I think, I think, uh, after some some flower movement in 2014, I think Taiwanese young people, uh, more and more young people, they started get engaged, involved in not just in political issues but social movements as well. So we we can see a lot of young people they. Uh, play more important role, uh, role, roles in different NGOs, different uh, human rights uh, organizations in Taiwan. So I think uh, after in do, uh, in 2013-14, we can see a lot of young people they feel like they can change Taiwan with more participation. So I think uh, that that trend is still going. Of course, I think I can see that that trend has been a, a bit down in 2017, maybe. But but when Taiwan, when there uh, when there is something wrong with Taiwan, when when the when the direction uh, is going to somewhere that they didn't expect it, like Han Guoyu, Han Han KMT's uh, candidate Han Guoyu led to. Uh, I think those young people who inspired, who got deeply inspired by the movements uh, in 2014, they will come on, they will show up, show up and try to influence, try to be engaged again, try to uh, be more active again. So we, we can see a lot of young people uh, quite uh, been very supportive 
for me, for uh, President Tsai Ing-wen as well, and try to try to uh, direct, try to redirect Taiwan to the right of this uh, direction. So I think that's what I think we should, uh, all the politicians in Taiwan should keep in mind that how to keep the young people in Taiwan and uh, uh, still, still get deeply uh, participate in Taiwan's politics is very important. That will, that's kind of the, the driving force of Taiwan's pro, uh, progression. I think that's very important. So I, I, that all the politicians should keep in mind the, that there, there will be more and more younger, there will be younger generation in a few years. And so how we, how we get them, how we let them be engaged in the movement in our political cause i think that's uh, that's very important and thank god that we have so many younger uh, legislators in the legislative un and in the local level of uh, different offices as well and so i think with more young people who are in the politics political arena right now they will work very hard to inspire more people to to involved Great, thanks. Um, so now we have questions from our virtual audience. Uh, the first one comes from Catherine Schultz. She's a research associate at uh, GTI. And her question is about the highest ever recorded numbers of those identifying as Taiwanese in, the, in this year's polls. Do you believe this is mainly a result of recent events in Hong Kong, as well as the PRC's handling of the coronavirus epidemic, and that it's a number which may decline again for some reason, or do you see this as an irreversible trend? It's an irreversible trend. It's a it's a, a, a obvious trend that uh, that uh, started from late nineties. So so according to different researches, it's a trend. It's the difference just be, just about the speed of the trend uh, being identified. The people. Uh, more uh, how the trend uh, go fast or slow it's it, it, it might change uh, according to different uh, different uh, uh, based on different news different uh, incident different things happen in the short time that trend might change its speed but the trend, the direction of the of the trend uh, will not uh, stop. And I think with ex-president like Ma ying in Taiwan, he will always fire up that trend. So with Ma ying with Xi Jinping, and with all those uh, people, all those extremists who support CCP in Taiwan, that trend will be fired up. Uh, I, I'm always optimistic. Great. Uh, our next question comes from Russell Shao. He's the executive director of GTI. He said, what more can the governments and people of Taiwan in the free world do to help the people of Hong Kong? Uh, a second uh, follow-up question is, is Taiwan's legislature considering similar legislations that would authorize the use of harder measures in response to China's oppression of Hong Kong people's rights, such as sanctions? Um, then is there anything that Taiwan can do to counter CCP influence efforts and United Front work in Hong Kong? Uh, Chinese oppression is deep fear for Taiwanese society and uh, an and unavoidable issue in our politics. Supporting those who are oppressed by China is supporting Taiwan's normalization as a state. So I think most of the Taiwanese people support the idea uh, of supporting Hong Kong or Tibet or Xinjiang. And Taiwan can't stand out of this, but we can't face this alone either. So the Taiwanese government should unite democratic countries to block Chinese expansion and provide our biggest support to Hong Kong people. Um, I think moreover, I think Taiwanese people should continue to follow the issue of Hong Kong and put pressure on our government to realize Hong Kong supporting measures. Uh, like the like like what have been done in the U.S. Like a lot of acts, a lot of measures, harder act measures that have been uh, placed in different countries. That I think 
our government and our parliament are discuss, discussing uh, and try to compare different measures from different countries. And we, I think uh, a lot of things we will follow up. So we are, uh, I think, uh, after all, we are defending Hong Kong people's hope for democracy. I think more we are doing, I think Hong Kong people, they can see their hope. So uh, I, so I think with the support from people, uh, from Taiwanese people, I think we will, I, I believe our government and the parliament will do more. Question comes from um, Marshall Reed. He's a research assistant at GTI. He said, uh, what were your goals in founding the New Power Party? Do you feel that establishing the party was an effective means of translating popular sentiment into formal politics? And do you believe that MPP retains the spirit of the Sunflower Movement? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know uh, if you uh, follow the recent news that actually there have been a lot of uh, difficulties happen in New Power Party. And actually, I have been an, I have left New Power Party last August. So uh, I'm an independent member of the parliament right now. And although I have quite, I used to have a lot of friends in, in MVP, but in recent weeks, it's kind of, uh, I got rare friends there because one, one by one they left as well. So, so I think, I think, but the good thing is that, uh, that uh, they are uh, uh, in last year after, uh, after the local election in 2018, uh, a lot of young people decided to join, uh, to, to be more pa participative uh, in politics. So try to work hard in different areas, in different parties, like in DBP, like in Jijin. Jijin the English is how to There is an, another uh, younger party called Taiwan Jijin. So although there are a lot of uh, difficulties happen, a lot of uh, conflicts happen in in MPP, and a lot of uh, friends have left MPP. But I think the young people, when they want to save Taiwan, when they want to be more participate uh, with Taiwan's politics, they will find right positions. Like Lin Feifan, uh, he he is the uh, vice secretary uh, in DPP, right? So. Yeah. Oh, Deputy Secretary General uh, Lin Feifan has has been there since last year, I think. So I think all the young people, uh, a lot of young people who are passionate, they will find the right position for them to to uh, to work together. Uh, even we are in different positions. And but for me, I I will stay independent for for a few years because I think, um, for example, for the uh, group, uh, for example, for the uh, Taiwan Parliament Group for Hong Kong, it need to be a cross-party uh, organization in Parliament. I can remember when I got re-elected early this year, Huang Zifeng, Zhou Xia Huang, uh, he came to Taiwan to discuss with me, asked if the group for Hong Kong in this term can be a cross party one, not like last term that it has been very narrow and uh, fewer and fewer members participate in the group for Hong Kong in last term of Taiwan's parliament. So I realized that it can be done only if I'm an independent. So uh, this term, uh, our Taiwan Parliament Group for Hong Kong, we have members from uh, DPP, of course, and MPP, and Min Zhong Dang, uh, Min Zhong TPP, and also uh, KMT. Yeah, very surprised, right? <laughs> Don't be surprised, but and KMT as well. So, so with cross party supports, uh, Joshua Huang and Hong Kong activists in Hong Kong, they can, they can, uh, they can they can react to the propaganda of uh, CCP saying that the support from, for Hong Kong from Taiwan is only from DPP. If it's a cross-party support, then for the Hong Kong activists, it will be a very cher cherishable uh, 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 
forced to to let them to let them feel that they are supported actually by everybody by cross party support. So I think that's very important for me. I will stay independent for some uh, very important works in the parliament. All right. Well, um, thank you so much, Legislator Lim, for your remarks and answering questions from the audience. Uh, we really appreciate you taking the time to be with us today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Bye. Okay. Um, now we will turn to our panel of experts. Uh, panelists, please turn on your video and microphones. And um, I will also move so that the sun is not in my face. Um, sorry. Um, our first speaker is Ming Shou He is professor in the Department of Sociology um, at National Taiwan University. He studies social movements, labor sociology, and environmental issues. He is the author of Working Class Formation in Taiwan, Fractured Solidarity, and State-Owned Enterprises, published in 2014 in Challenging Beijing's Mandate of Heaven, Taiwan's Sunflower Movement, and Hong Kong's Umbrella Movement, which was published in 2019. Next, Christina Lai will speak. Christina is a junior research fellow in the Institute of Political Science at Academia Sinica in Taiwan. She was previously a lecturer in global security studies at Johns Hopkins University, and her research focuses on U.S.-China relations, Chinese foreign policy, East Asian politics, and qualitative research methods. Christina was also a GTI scholarship recipient in 2019, and she conducted field work in both Taiwan and Hong Kong for a report that will be released after today's event. Christina's occasional report entitled A Case Study of Recent Social Movements in Hong Kong and Taiwan, Convergence of Counter Identities Amid China's Rise will be made available on our website at globaltaiwan.org later today. Our third speaker is Lu Wei Rose Lu Chou, who is an assistant professor at the School of Communication at Hong Kong Baptist University. Rose researches censorship, propaganda, and social movements in authoritarian regimes. She has been a journalist for 20 years and was the 2007 Neiman Fellow at Harvard University. Last but not least, we have Sophie Richardson, who is the China Director at Human Rights Watch and an author of numerous articles on domestic Chinese political reform, democratization, and human rights in Cambodia, China, Indonesia, Hong Kong, the Philippines, and Vietnam. Sophie is the author of China, Cambodia, and the Five Principles of Peaceful Coexistence, and has testified before the European Parliament and the U.S. Senate and House of Representatives. Um, each panelist will have uh, 10 minutes um, to provide opening remarks, followed by a moderated discussion in a Q&A with the virtual audience. So as a reminder to our virtual audience, please send in your questions to our panelists via our YouTube page or send an email to contact at globaltaiwan.org. Uh, so without further ado, Ming Xiu, over to you. Thank you. Uh, it's, it's a great honor and pleasure to share with you my observation of what happened in Taiwan and Hong Kong. But first of all, let me share my, my presentation file with you. Just give me a, a few seconds. So this is my presentation file. Uh, I will be looking at uh, the response of Taiwan, both from the government and the civil society to the protest last year. So let me give you a, a quick description of what happened in Hong Kong. So uh, we all know that there was an execution bill being promoted. And the, 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 the excuse of, of the Hong Kong government was that there was an unsolved murder, murder in Taiwan, and since Taiwan and Hong Kong does not have judicial uh, exchange agreement, so that's why they need a no uh, amendment to just allow the fugitive transfer. And the protest surged in Hong Kong in, in, in June, and I think the, the really dynamic peak in November. But, and with uh, this year and uh, earlier in January, we have COVID nineteen, so the protests become um, smaller, but it's still there. And as of one year, there have been more than nine thousand arrestees, and up to nearly two thousand people have been persecuted and two thousand being sentenced, and and hundreds of being uh, people fleeing abroad, including Taiwan. And we all know since last month there was a national security law. And that really spelled the end of our own country system as we knew it. Um, and now uh, the protests in Hong Kong right now is more underground. But 
So let me uh, uh, briefly explain what happened in Taiwan. So government, uh, because the, the, the law was about murder in Taiwan, so Taiwan was involved at the very beginning. So, uh, but I think the Taiwan government made a very decisive early intervention that it made, it, it announced that it's not going to pursue the, the extradition under the law because the law actually see Taiwan as a part of PRC. So that, that was, uh, made, the announcement was made in spring. And with the protest emerging in June, Taiwan has uh, announced his personal protest. And there was a, a, a joint statement in legislature last June. Also, uh, the effect was, uh, the meaning was, uh, the main effect was to support the movement. And also, uh, Taiwan has started its humanitarian aid toward those who come from Hong Kong and take shelter in Taiwan. That happened last month, but people, uh, the government didn't want to uh, publicize, publicize, and with the coming of national security law this year, uh, so there was a new Taiwan and Hong Kong Service Exchange Office in Hong Kong. So, and there are a lot of criticism coming from Taiwan, uh, coming from Hong Kong, and coming from PRC that Taiwan was a black hand uh, behind this, uh, uh, this protest movement. And Taiwan and US are the two uh, so called foreign forces that quite often mentioned. But I think what the government in Taiwan do was very firm in their rhetoric in the discourse that they are not going to collaborate with Hong Kong on that issue. And also, the Taiwan government offer a lot of help, but they don't want to uh, put a lot of spotlight on that. And as for the, the, the accusation of abating the process, I don't think that's quite possible uh, under the Chinese government. Um, and also, on the other hand, I think Taiwan is very important because it's it kind of it's become a it has been an overseas basis for Hong Kong's uh, campaign because it, Taiwan and Hong Kong is very close and there are frequent flights and many people coming from Hong Kong uh, study or work or come in here. So uh, a lot of people when they Hong Kong protest when they try to flee Hong Kong, the, their first stop uh, is usually Taiwan. And also I know a lot of Taiwanese people and Hong Kongers in Taiwan, they fly back to Hong Kong uh, to join the protest and to catch a ball in November. And Taiwan has become a logistic, logistic center to provide a lot of uh, movement uh, supplies like helmet, goggles, et etc. And quite a number of books that can now find a publisher in Hong Kong eventually get published in Taiwan. And also, I think in January election this year, we can speak, we can speak of a Hong Kong factor because you see many Hong Kong activists, politicians, uh, uh, they encourage you I want young people to come home to vote. And also, I know a number of Hong Kongers in Taiwan actually joined the Hangul Rico campaign. So it is quite unprecedented. And also, I want to show you my observation on the protest, uh, the solidarity protest taking place in, Hong, in Taiwan, because I've done some uh, research on a newspaper report, primarily by um, Apple Daily and Liberty Times. Uh, so from June last year to early to January this year, I was able to find 95 events in Taiwan, including uh, a number of uh, most of them are assembly and uh, there are also demonstration, concerts, and film screening. And in terms of uh, spatial uh, distribution, I think it's quite evenly distributed. So less than half of the event took place in Taipei. You may think the Taiwan is a capital and you have legislature and state uh, presidential office. And you also have Hong Kong representative office in Taiwan. But actually, Taiwan, the, the Taipei is not that in, important as you might imagine. So even in some remote area like Hualien, in, in Dindong and Mali, you also find some events going on there. And also there are Vietnam Wars in a number of urban public space and also in high schools. Uh, and but what happened in high school was never reported, but a lot, a lot, quite a number of high school students in Taiwan really care about what happened in Hong Kong. And I think, uh, because I've been talking to a lot, uh, a number of Hong Kong activists overseas, like in Canada, in, in Australia, in UK, US, I think it's interesting to compare them uh, with uh, Hong Kong here in Taiwan, because I think what happened in Taiwan is much more locally embedded. Because if you look at the sponsorship, but who, that is a question of who organized these events. I think actually uh, majority of them were organized by Taiwanese and it much more than those organized by Hong Kong, uh, the only 19 events out of them. And 26 of the events are actually joint collaboration between Hong Kong and Taiwanese. So, whereas in other countries, what you see is more like a, 
a movement by Hong Kong's diaspora community, and they try to connect with the local issues. So, like for example, uh, Hong Kong in, Hong in UK will try to give money uh, to the hospital to to uh, give money uh, give masks to the uh, hospi hospital staff to to face the to the, the, the COVID nineteen crisis because they want to show that, that they are part of the community. So that's why Hong Kong, what happened in Hong Kong, really need attention from people in UK. But I think what happened in Taiwan is is quite com is quite uh, different because Taiwanese actually show their, their concern. So when you see it, what happened is that you see active participation from Taiwan civil society. So a number of the events are were organized by the students, uh, that's 47 all of them, and 23 by NG and 12 by political organization, including parties, and 10 by churches. And I think uh, we saw uh, deeply involvement from Taiwanese people. I think that what they do is more than just support Hong Kong, more than just demonstrating this. Also, they bring Taiwan's own agenda. Like for example, for those involved with students and NGO, what they concern is that uh, earlier last year, the, the KMD was talking about a peace agreement. And if that happened, and they were really worried about that Taiwan is moving closer to the status of Hong Kong right now, so what they concern is that they want to oppose that. They, uh, so they bring that into the agenda. And for political parties like uh, DPP, uh, New Power Party, uh, uh, Taiwan State Building Party, and Taiwan State Unions, they were all a player in this year's election. So what they do is try to use the Hong Kong issue to rally their supporters. Um, but I have to say that uh, I, I talked to a quite a number of Hong Kongers in Taiwan. So the they experience of these Taiwanese uh, held event are quite mixed. Some feel it's great, it's a solidarity, but some feel it's kind of alienation. But what they see is more Taiwan's concern rather than Hong Kong's concern. And also we have uh, lawyers uh, try to uh, organize to assist the refugee from Hong Kong. And also churches involvement is very interesting because uh, a lot of democratic activists in Hong Kong, like Benny Dai and Jaffa Wong, they're all Christian and they have long established relationships with Taiwan's churches. So we know church in, in, are quite uh, diversified and they have a problem with the gay issue, same-sex issue. But what I see is that even the conservative church and the progressive church are united on, on the Hong Kong issues. So what we see here, you see a coming together of students, NGO and lawyers, even churches. I think what I, I can we can characterize this is a re, the emergence of some pro alliance that we saw six years ago. And also, uh, let me share you, with you two surveys. Uh, one is the one took place last year, last November. That was before election, and the other one is during this year. So around sixty-eight to seventy-eight people who support Hong Kong parties. A lot. The figure is even higher than the vote that Taiwan will get this year. So I think the support is very solid and quite partisan. So let me come to the concluding uh, remarks. Uh, I think uh, I think it is very important and for Hong Kong's movement because Taiwan reject that that amendment. So government, Hong Kong government, really cannot claim this this amendment is is promoting to solve an uh, unsolved uh, murder and then give legitimacy to the Hong Kong resistance movement. And also from 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 uh, Taiwan's uh, public opinion and civil society, I think we see unprecedented support and support for Hong Kong. And that went much higher. That was much higher than what we see the uh, umbrella movement in 2014. And the final question I want to address here that I think um, probably a lot of people were interested that it would DPP win the election without the Hong Kong factor? Um, they have you can this question can be answered in many ways, but Personally, for me, I think the book, the DV probably would have win, but the margin would be smaller. Uh, there are a number of reasons that, uh, if there were no Hong Kong issues there, because, uh, the DPP was much more united and Thai support rate got rebounds uh, actually, uh, before that. Um, and also the opposition, the PMP is running a problematic campaign. There are problems with the candidate selection, a problem with the party unity. So all coming together, I think Hong Kong factor really in, is important, but it's not all. Not, it's, it's, it's probably the most decisive factor, but it's not that important as you can see. So I am my sharing here, and thank you very much.
Uh, thank you, Ming Xiu. Um, it was a very good presentation. And for anyone who's interested in a more in-depth look at the social movements in Taiwan and Hong Kong, I would highly recommend Professor Ho's book, uh, Challenging on Beijing's Mandate of Heaven. Um, it goes in-depth into the origins of the Sunflower Movement, also the Umbrella Movement. And um, it just has a lot of rich detail on the activists who are involved. Um, and so next, uh, we'll move on to Christina. Hi, everyone. Hi, we can hear you. Yes. Yeah. So good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Christina Lai. Uh, I'm currently a junior research fellow in the Institute of Political Science at uh, Academia Sinica. Um, I truly appreciate the generous research support uh, for the Global Taiwan Institute uh, in my policy report on uh, Hong Kong anti-extradition bill protests in 2019, as well as the Umbrella Movement in Hong Kong and the Sunflower Movement in Taiwan. They both took place in 2012, uh, 2014. And the slogans such as uh, Today Hong Kong, Tomorrow Ta Taiwan, and Hong Kong Taiwan were together were frequently here among the activists in those movements and were widely reported uh, in media coverage. And they have become the reference point in broader political discourse about the future of China relations with Hong Kong and Taiwan and Taiwan Hong Kong relations. So my policy report offer a comparative analysis about the role of social movement play uh, in the Taiwan Hong Kong China triangle. And based on the survey result and uh, news article and public statement. My study offers an argument for explaining how identity narrative in Hong Kong and Taiwan has emerged and converged uh, in recent years. And most importantly, I like to highlight there's a, a significant demonstration effect in Taiwan and Hong Kong on one another in terms of their uh, mobilization strategy uh, and framing, framing of the political discourse. And the major finding of my work indicates that many Hong Kong activists were actually inspired by the social uh, sunflower movement that took place in Taiwan uh, around uh, 2014. And many Taiwanese has offered uh, strong support to the umbrella uh, movement as well. So for the pro-democracy group in Hong Kong, the sunflower movement and Taiwan's de de democratic legacy has provided a great example of how democracy and political aut uh, autonomy can be implement successfully uh, in a Chinese speaking uh, society. That is why I think the emergence of Taiwanese and Hong Kong's identity that's distinctive from a Chinese one has occurred at the same time uh, as the exchange between China and both Taiwan and Hong Kong uh, in terms of trade and tourism, uh, student exchange were increasing. So in a major way, I think the anti-extradition bill protests and the sunflower movement and umbrella movement uh, in Hong Kong and Taiwan uh, provide a great example of uh, the younger generation growing doubts and concern about the economic and political integration uh, with China. Uh, uh, specifically, if you look into their political discourse in those social movements, in defending their uh, core value in the face of uh, more powerful and increasingly nationalistic China, activists in Hong Kong and, and Taiwan have developed a, a sense of uh, identity or a sense of community, arguably it begins uh, around 2014. The anti-extradition bill protest, as well as the Sunflower Movement and Umbrella Movement has provided great opportunity uh, in establishing connection and exchange of idea between the activists uh, in those places. And I think the effect of Taiwan social movement on Hong Kong has been quite salient beginning uh, in 2014. And even though the substance of Taiwan's and Hong Kong's political identity might be quite different, a slogan such as uh, Love Taiwan or Safeguard Hong Kong has proven impact, significant impacts on the political mobilization during the election in both places.
And I, I think I'll, I'll, I'll uh, conclude my uh, presentation by highlighting some, some of the policy implication uh, for Taiwan and China and also for U US government. So the sunflower movements in Taiwan and umbrella movements in Hong Kong and the recent demonstration against the anti-extradition bill in 2019 were the major political protests in, in terms of the number of participants in these two places. And this event has substantial impacts on China's image internationally and China's image among the Hong Kong and Taiwan citizens. Uh, while these three movements have dif different agenda in detail, but they all re represent an explicit rejection of China's strategy of integration. More importantly, I think the political activists in Hong Kong will see China, uh, Taiwan uh, social movement as a role model, while the younger generation in Taiwan will view the current situation uh, in Hong Kong as a cautionary retail. Therefore, the mutual support demonstrated between the civil organization in Hong Kong and Taiwan at those movements uh, has shown that these activists do learn from each other. And the social movement has fostered a deeper sense of uh, community between Taiwan and Hong Kong. And that is why uh, my policy report also carries some implication uh, for China, Taiwan, and US. Um, in terms of the uh, in terms of chi Chinese government, I think China's kind of negative attitude to the pursuit of democracy and rule of law, and its frequent use of uh, economic coercion to its neighbor, will start to uh, pose concern uh, for both uh, country in Asia and in the West. So, how Asian country perceive China's rising cap capability and how they understand the way that China handles its relation with Hong Kong and Taiwan will greatly, inf uh, uh, will greatly uh, impact China's foreign policy behavior in the future. I think most of the Asian country will face a difficult choice uh, between the China and the United States, especially uh, their power struggle became more intense over time. Therefore, I think Beijing should really recalibrate uh, both its rhetoric and policy toward Taiwan and Hong Kong if it wants to maintain a pos positive image or wanted to achieve a political leadership in Asia. And secondly, uh, what, would, what would the Taiwanese government do in terms of the uh, uh, future of China, Taiwan and Hong Kong relation? I think the network of activists uh, in Taiwan and Hong Kong will likely to grow more interconnected over time. And the framing strategy they have adopted in those two places are centered around solidarity and empathy uh, among the general republic. So as Beijing, you know, uh, increasingly, uh, increasingly being more assertive, uh, trying to incorporate Hong Kong into its uh, sphere of influence, as we can see the uh, recent example of its rapid passage of national security law. It is really up to Taiwan, the United States, and Hong Kong citizens to demonstrate uh, their commitment to maintain Hong Kong role as a vibrant city for financial and cultural and social exchange in East Asia. Therefore, I think the Taiwanese government should really uh, follow up the recent development in Hong Kong uh, seriously as the fate of Hong Kong and Taiwan have become inter intertwined in the eyes of Beijing. Uh, finally, I'll, I'll say, uh, offer some policy implications for the United States. I think the United States uh, government has substantial stakes in the future of Hong Kong. Uh, more importantly, I think Hong Kong has actively supported U.S. effort in gathering intelligence and its fight against terrorism, money laundry, and intellectual property theft. And more recently, the Trump administration has already uh, imposed sanctions against Chinese officials uh, inviting op oppression of Hong Kong social movement. But I think it can, those measures can be more effectively employed uh, if, uh, if the United States will cooperate with other countries in the Asia Pacific region and beyond. And uh, finally, I think the stronger U.S. support for Hong Kong and Taiwan would not only contribute to the future stability and the prosperity 
of East Asia, but also can send a clear message of its commitment to uh, democratic alliances in Asia uh, when, when they face a more strong and assertive China. So I think in the next few years, a US-Hong Kong relation will likely call for a more sustained and multifaceted support by the US government in order to uphold US national interests and university, universal value. Yeah, um, uh, basically uh, that's the major finding and policy implication of my policy report. And I'm looking forward uh, to feedback uh, from the panelists and also from the online audience. Thank you very much, Christina. Um, if audience members are interested in an extended version of Christine, Christina's talk today, uh, please check out her occasional report, which will be made available after this event. Uh, now we'll turn to Rose, who is coming to us from Hong Kong. Okay, thank you, Jennifer, for inviting me to join this uh, uh, event. Uh, I, I just realized I'm the only one from Hong Kong and talking about Hong Kong. So I'm not going to share any of my studies, uh, although my study, are, I did, do did some studies on the uh, like um, uh, state propaganda on the uh, entire, uh, on the uh, last year's protests. Uh, but I just want to share my personal experience uh, as a person uh, living under the national security law uh, for now, it's like almost two months. So every day something happened, uh, like today, people just feel angry and uh, sometimes uh, are frustrated, just don't know what to do, but also very persistent to uh, to fight for the uh, the the, the, the truth and uh, to resist the, the lies uh, assimilated by the authority. So uh, first, of all, first I want to share being a former journalist and to see under the national security law, what will be impact on the, uh, uh, the press freedom in Hong Kong. It's just because as you know, uh, Hong Kong, because of the one country, two system, compared with uh, mainland China, Hong Kong enjoy relatively more press freedom. Although we always say we don't have a democracy, but we do have freedom. So uh, we have a different media system compared with uh, mainland China. So all media were uh, a lot of uh, uh, private owned media, and uh, you can also publish anything. Uh, you can criticize uh, CCP or you can criticize Criticize uh, government, and uh, as there's a saying for a lot of mainland Chinese, like if you want to understand what's going on in mainland China, you need to read the newspapers in Hong Kong because you got all those uh, banned or uh, blocked information from Hong Kong. But nowadays, uh, it's just because of the new law, and it's very vague. And there is a lot of uncertainty raised, uh, especially for the uh, journalists in Hong Kong. For example, uh, the press freedom in Hong Kong has enabled its journalists to join the cross-border journalism investigation, which is made possible by the advent of the information technology. For example, like the Panama Paper. The Panama Paper investigation is an outstanding example of uh, such collaboration among journalists around the world. Uh, both China and Hong Kong are home to many of the individual and the companies have found hiding funds in secret offshore tax havens, and including state leaders, their relatives, right? So Hong Kong journalists uh, contributed to the, this effort by checking out the scandals of Chinese leaders and the senior officials. So now we have the national security law. So it has the provisions forbidden the release of information about the Chinese leader. So indeed, it has become uncertain whether Hong Kong media outlets can continue to report information deemed sensitive and secretive by the CCP and uh, such as accounts of a political and also such as the accounts of a political dissidents or human rights activists in mainland China. So those raise a lot of questions. And also I look at like uh, Hong Kong always be the base for a uh, foreign journalist. Uh, before, if you were kicked out uh, by the uh, Chinese government and you were denied visa by the Chinese foreign ministry. So you usually find your base in Hong Kong. 
So you can continue reporting uh, China from Hong Kong. But now it seems uh, things change. The rules uh, seems change. We don't know because nowadays foreign journalists in Hong Kong are facing highly unusual visa delays at a time of high tension between the U.S. and China. So many of my friends are working for uh, like a New York Times and was Journal. They are worried about their visa issue. They're still waiting. Usually it only takes like a few weeks, but now it's already like us months and they're still waiting for, but they just don't know whether they're able to continue uh, working uh, in Hong Kong as a foreign correspondent. They're reporting China and also reporting Hong Kong. So as you know, also because of the national security law, uh, New York Times uh, have to move their uh, part of their office to South Korea, uh, especially for their digital uh, session. So it's all because of the uh, uh, the uncertainty uh, along with the uh, the national security law. So and also being a teacher who are teaching journalism in the university, it also right uh, facing a lot of the challenges under the new law. Uh, for example, like before. Uh, a lot of uh, students from mainland China, they just uh, joined the programs here in Hong Kong. They just want to experience a different education system and understand uh, to enjoy more freedom here. So usually we would teach them like Hong Kong is a, a different media system. We have like a private uh, owned media and also, uh, for example, like uh, RTHK, the, uh, we, we call it a PBS, the prop, uh, Public Broadcasting Service, instead of like a compare with CCTV or state owned media, which you deem to be the mouthpiece of the uh, party, uh, they serve for the people. But nowadays you can see uh, there, there is some, uh, seems like some possible fundamental changes for the media environment here in Hong Kong, uh, especially for the role of the uh, RTHK as the, uh, whether it will continue to be the PBS or just be uh, the uh, state media owned by the government and served by the government. So this is the fundamental changes. We still see a lot of things happen that we just don't know what is going on. And also as an uh, academia, we also face a lot of uncertainties. <laughs> Uh, for example, my PhD dissertation is about the uh, nationalism and uh, state propaganda in open society like Hong Kong and the closed society in mainland China. I research uh, like Hong Kong independence and uh, Taiwan independence <laughs> and uh, uh, Tibet and the Xinjiang independence movement. So I definitely know that I would not be allowed to do that in mainland China. Also, 100% sure it would be safe if I based in Hong Kong, working for a Hong Kong university, that would be totally fine. But now uh, I think no one knows whether there be still be okay. So I talked to a lot of uh, uh, colleagues, whether they're going to teach some sensitive issues in the classroom for the coming new semester. <laughs> so you, you, I think probably you know the answer. Uh, because uh, uncertainty and for sure, and uh, maybe uh, you, you you don't know what's going on and uh, what would be happening in the classroom. And also like when I was invited for this event, I was hesitated for a few days. It's just because it might be considered as the collusion with the foreign powers, right? So <laughs> be a junior, be a very junior uh, faculty members, it would be very challenging for me to whether join this event or not. Um, so I think that would be like the self-censorship. Uh, one is the self-censorship because of fear and because of the uncertainty and the vague of the law. And also maybe that the, 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 uh, the, the effect the uh, authority want uh, by implementing this uh, vague law. Uh, and also recently we, we see the news about how elite universities in US they just want to say, oh, they just want to protect students from Hong Kong and mainland China. So they just label some courses and uh, uh, allow them to uh, exit for uh, discussion or by using anonymous uh, uh, presentations. Uh, those precautions, uh, you can consider it as the uh, protection for the students. But on the other hand, whether it sends some signal to the world and also to other universities, 
uh, whether we should uh, do the self-censorship. So I really want to hear more about that because uh, we still also have a lot of a discussion <laughs> what we should do. Like uh, some elite universities already did that. And as a, which, will that be the norm in the future for, uh, for the classroom? So, and I also want to say of uh, being a citizen uh, as an individual under the national security law, I think uh, we still uh, uh, have to adjust for that because uh, I came from Shanghai, grew up in Shanghai, educated in Fudan University. We, I totally understand the censorship and what are the red lines. But nowadays, what are the red lines? What are what kind of contents considered to be the sensitive or a harm to the national security? Um, nobody knows, uh, especially in Hong Kong, because we all used to about that kind of freedom of speech. You can talk whatever you like, and like. but now suddenly some slogans and some words are not allowed to say. If you say that, maybe you will be considered to be like a, a, a broken the law. And like when the uh, medical professions, uh, they criticize the policies of the government policy, uh, the uh, chief executive will say, oh, you are smear uh, the central government. And oh, if you related to smear the central government and to the national security, it would be very dangerous, seems very dangerous. So yeah, uh, but still have some uh, bright side, I think, <laughs> to keep me feel very optimistic. It's uh, maybe back to our top here is the uh, Hong Kong people, uh, have a very strong identity uh, related to this uh, city. It's just because of the language, the way of life, and also I think the culture. Uh, so this is a very important. It rooted in this uh, uh, society. And Hong Kong also have a long history of uh, a, a, a very mature civil society and a long history of a social movement. So uh, that will help people to uh, resist this kind of, uh, 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 you know, no danger or pressure. But I just don't know how long, because it would be, uh, you, you cost a lot of the society of individual. So uh, how long it can uh, persist uh, by people here? Um, yeah, we, we, we just want to uh, wait and see. And I also want to say one thing is I don't, I, 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 people, uh, you guys talk a lot about the sunflower movement and the umbrella movement. But I really want to say my observation was uh, in 2012, uh, the, anti, the protest of the implementation of national education uh, movement in Hong Kong. I think that have a very uh, large impact in, the, uh, in the Asia. I can see it has some uh, inspirations to people, young people in Taiwan, but also in Thailand, Singapore, and the Japan. So, and uh, in 2014, when the young people in uh, Thailand is here against the uh, martial law, so it also has some impact on the other people. So I, I, I do think uh, open societies, to, uh, I do have some hope on the, uh, this is just because if we have a flow of information and the people, uh, do can uh, inspire by people from other uh, countries or other side of the uh, uh, the world, and uh, yeah, it would be a, like a, a trend. It would be very difficult for the authority to to stop it. Yeah, I I'm just a stop here. Thanks. <laughs> Um, the impact of on um, new academic freedom under you know this new national security law. Thanks so much. Um, Hi, thanks very much. Um, thanks, enormous thanks to uh, the Global Taiwan Institute for inviting me to join. We Human Rights Watch doesn't do a lot of work on Taiwan, which is a good thing. Uh, uh, but it's great to have the opportunity to listen to the other panelists and learn a lot. I also want to thank Professor Rose for her courage, because you are an example of the reality that, that pro-democracy voices, pro-rights voices in Hong Kong are now living, which is that you do have to stop and think about whether participating in a panel like this might result in an actual charge and prosecution. Um, Hong Kong, Human Rights Watch has worked on Hong Kong for decades, going back to writing about 
uh, abuses of refugees' rights in Hong Kong in the 1980s to all of the issues around uh, the handover to PRC control across the 90s. Uh, over the last several years, we have had depressingly to focus on uh, threats to the rights of political participation, uh, the right to expression, which really runs the gamut everywhere from education to journalism uh, to other kinds of peaceful criticism. Obviously, we've written about threats to the right to assembly. It's our view as is the case from the perspective of United Nations experts that Hong Kong's public order ordinance is not in conformity with international law. And we've seen it used quite a bit in recent years as a way of uh, placing undue restrictions on the right of assembly. I think we're also extraordinarily concerned about threats to the rule of law and the right to a fair trial. And you know, let's be clear, one of the Hong Kong realities that long distinguished the territory from the mainland, it was a very independent, highly professional uh, judicial system that was all that was largely insulated from political influence. Uh, we've already talked about uh, the uh, the proposed extradition amendments and the way that played uh, it with the public and reactions uh, both from Taiwan and from other quarters. Uh, but I think we, we should be looking not just at who actually is being prosecuted for what, but also who isn't being prosecuted. Uh, you know, there are, there are some pretty stark differences there alongside you know, the very clear cut uh, problems around, for example, uh, the mainland authorities intervening in interpretations of the basic law before they had even made their way all the way through Hong Kong courts. Um, I think 2020 has been uniquely awful for human rights uh, in Hong Kong. I think there's there's no other way around that. Uh, you know, clearly, the you know the the development of the Chinese government imposing, let's be clear, imposing with zero consultation uh, with people in Hong Kong with their elected representatives, a draconian law that essentially criminalizes whatever the authorities want whenever they want to criminalize it. Uh, and proceeding, you know, in some cases through mainland courts, the creation of a new police force uh, to help implement this law is really disastrous uh, on many levels. We've described it publicly as a roadmap for repression. And for the purposes of this conversation, again, I, I, I commend Professor Rose for her participation because one of the most immediate devastating effects of the law, even before it went into effect, was watching some of Hong Kong's incredibly capable long-standing civil society groups or newly formed political parties dissolve out of fear that simply being part of those organizations could lead to a prosecution. Uh, obviously, Taiwan uh, has long uh, offered a safe harbor for people who wanted to carry out their activism uh, from there. Uh, but I think the 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 aspirations that the Chinese authorities set out in including uh, a clause about extraterritoriality in the national security law is really a remarkable and, and new, or I should say newly codified form of overreach. We've all watched the Chinese government reach out increasingly into other countries and international institutions to exert influence there. I don't think we've ever seen anything as, as naked and inserted into an actual law as the extraterritoriality clause of the national security law. Um, so, in addition to the imposition of the national security law, the postponement of the LegCo elections in September, which were widely expected to see pro-democratic voices do well, uh, and, and that, that the chief executive, Carrie Lam, chose to explain or justify that postponement uh, on the grounds of the COVID crisis, we found uh, really extremely disingenuous. I think perhaps, you know, second only to the administrative, the electoral administrative capacity of Taiwan, Hong Kong could have turned very quickly to alternative arrangements for people to be able to vote. Uh, the suggestion that that could not have been done time frame, I think, is profoundly disingenuous and clearly designed, I think, to prevent uh, 
pro-democracy legislators from running on an equal footing or frankly being able to run at all. It will be interesting to see how this plays out next year. There have been more prosecutions of pro-democracy activists and legislators than we can keep track of. Uh, even in you know, the last 24 hours, we have two more arrests of uh, lawmakers on highly, highly dubious charges. Uh, it's uh, Lam Chuk Ting and Ted Hoy who were arrested, it seems, for being present at a protest and sharing footage of it. The, the Hong Kong police's description of the behavior that's supposedly problematic is really questionable. Uh, and it raises questions if, you know, if Chinese state media is providing footage of protests, are they going to be prosecuted too? Uh, you know, there are these incredibly lopsided allegations. But to spend a, a, just a few minutes talking about the global reactions to these developments uh, in Hong Kong, as others have, have outlined, uh, you know, I, I think it is fair to say that we have seen more of a global reaction, uh, both at a very personal level and at governmental level, to the developments in Hong Kong maybe than we have to uh, what's happened, for example, in recent years in Xinjiang. And I think that's partly because lots of different kinds of people around the world have traveled to Hong Kong, they've studied there, they've worked there, they've lived there, they have a connection to it uh, in a way that, well, frankly, people aren't allowed to have in Xinjiang. But I think many governments uh, who were already starting to revise some of their assumptions or perceptions of the Chinese government's agenda in the world, largely as a result of what's happened in Xinjiang or around the South China Seas, for example, have watched the developments in Hong Kong and, and responded more because it is such a clear example of Beijing's disdain for binding international treaties, in this case, the Sino-British Joint Declaration, uh, its willingness to make political demands of global businesses like HSBC. I think that's been very disconcerting <laughs> for some people. You know, or its hostility towards human rights and democracy and the kinds of pressure also that's being brought to bear on the media and academic institutions in Hong Kong. I think it's been such an onslaught against rights for so many different communities that it's triggered a bit of a different response. And, I think the strongest reactions have come from the UK, the US, the EU, Australia, and others we think of as being among sort of the usual suspects to respond to these developments. The US has imposed sanctions on senior Hong Kong and mainland leaders, uh, removed Hong Kong's special status. Uh, a number of governments have suspended their extradition treaties with Hong Kong. We've also pushed quite a few governments to state publicly and unequivocally that they will not in any way cooperate with or enable prosecutions under the national security law, which I think matters, particularly as people who are involved in these debates you know, are operating from Taiwan or the US or other places around the world. So if governments get a request from the Hong Kong police uh, that they are pursuing a suspect on national security law charges, those governments should flatly reject that. Uh, uh, I also want to just note that we've, we've also really encouraged governments to do all they can to keep protecting the space that does still exist for independent civil society, for independent media. Uh, and, you know, that space is shrinking. And again, it's not clear, I think, what people can and can't do. Uh, and people haven't necessarily made up their minds in Hong Kong about what they're comfortable doing. But we want to make sure that the extraordinary activism that's been on display in the last several years, uh, you know, continues to be supported. Uh, you know, the U.S.'s reaction in some ways, uh, I think, has been good. They're using tools that that are appropriate for the circumstances, things like global Magnitsky sanctions. Uh, you know, but they do come against the backdrop of a U.S. administration that has a very problematic human rights track record globally. Uh, and it is hard to disaggregate the motivations for the, the steps around Hong Kong and, and mainland human rights issues from larger issues in the bilateral relationship. We could maybe come back to that in the Q&A if you'd like. Um, one of the steps that we really, or one of the arenas that we think is very important is about puncturing the Chinese government's expectations of impunity in bodies like the UN's Human Rights Council. It's our view that it is high time 
that Beijing is held to the same standard as other governments for clear violations of international human rights obligations. Uh, I, I just want to close with a very quick point, particularly about the role and of, of civil society. And you know, one is that hopefully to all of those who have been part of the Sunflower Movement, the Umbrella Movement, and, and many of the other civil society generated initiatives in recent years, hope that there's still a strong sense of solidarity with civil independent civil society in the mainland. This is a community that has suffered horribly under President Xi. Uh, people are paying an extraordinary price, even simply to have conversations like the one that we're having today. Uh, and I think it's important that they not be lost in these discussions. If there's if there's a, 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 an upside to this reality, though, to try to be a little optimistic, as legislator Lim has suggested we should be, it's that I think the, the repression that we've seen emanating from Beijing under Xi Jinping has created and contributed to a kind of solidarity between Hong Kong, Taiwan, Xinjiang, Tibet, mainland international organizations or seen before. And I think that is something we should all recommit to supporting uh, to the fullest extent possible. So I'll stop there because I'm sure people um, will want to debate some of these ideas and, and hand the floor back to Jennifer. Thanks. All right, thank you so much, Sophie. Uh, so we've had four great presentations. Um, I wanna remind our audience uh, to send in their questions to the panelists. Uh, because we only have about 10 minutes left, I'll integrate my questions with those of um, our audience members. Um, right now I see two parallel processes going on um, in Hong Kong and Taiwan in terms of having um, both social movements, uh, but also um, this um, identity formation or identity development. And I think both of them are mutually reinforcing processes. Um, in terms of um, some of the causes that may um, inspire uh, especially young people uh, to join such uh, movements or, or rallies or go onto the streets, maybe due to their own unique identity, identifying themselves first and foremost with either Taiwan or Hong Kong um, to the exclusion of a, a, a unique China, exclusive Chinese identity. And I think throughout the process of even engaging in such rallies, I think, you know, identity formation is also occurring uh, in the sense that um, they're, they're further strengthening their association uh, with their unique local identity um, as opposed to uh, being exclusively Chinese. And I think this is also occurring um, even despite uh, their um, further economic integration with mainland China. Um, and so this kind of begs the question, um, is China's economic term, you know, basically failing to um, inspire uh, people in Hong Kong and Taiwan to uh, view themselves closer to China, or are or is China's um, economic kind of penetration, both Hong Kong and Taiwan, um, also maybe one source of frustration or grievance, um, in the sense that it it. Um, creates the threat that um, through economic integration, there may be other sorts of um, penetration to, for example, politics and society, and thus uh, China's economic charm becomes more um, a threat to their local identities, and thus they must push back. Um, and so uh, my question to um, Professor Ho is that, you know, we see young people um, really come to the forefront of these um, social movements. And I'm just wondering, is there a generational kind of explanation for why um, we see such great activism among young people? Um, and, to, and to what extent does um, economics play into it? Because I feel like there is um, a balance between um, you know, fighting for uh, material benefits such as, you know, jobs and, and um, a better kind of a prosperous future um, and also, you know, going out to the streets to fight for more normative goals and ideals. And I'm wondering if the actual environment in both Taiwan and Hong Kong actually contributes to it because we see um, rising inequality, we see kind of stagnant wages, um, and especially in Taiwan. So does that kind of 
put together, um, make um, the young people in particular just, you know, decide that they want to um, really go out and, and fight for, for these causes. And this question is for Professor Hu. Should I go now? Yeah, sure. Oh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. That's a really good question. So you see uh, Taiwanese young people, uh, Okay, in the poll, I, I just show in my demonstration, actually you see the generational difference, the age difference. The young people are more overwhelmingly support of Hong Kong's bodies. And actually a lot of, a lot of phenomena that uh, uh, also called related with age, like the support for uh, Taiwan independence, also like uh, same-sex uh, marriage support rate. So you see the generation, young people in Taiwan are, are, are embracing a different outlook and there are a lot of explanations for that because like for example they grew up some of them just uh, were born in this century so they really have no idea of the white terror or even martial law era in taiwan and so they were born really born free you know um and also one of the commonality they share with their hong kong peer is that uh, these two societies were kind of facing economic uh, stagnation in set in, in terms of wages, and also in the case of Hong Kong, that was rising house prices. So the so younger generation of Taiwan and Hong Kong share the same economic grievance in that they feel that uh, there used to be a, a bright spot, uh, a, a, a bright a moment for Hong Kong and Taiwan, but the moment had been passed. And what they have is limited and shrinking economic opportunity. So a lot of their outlook actually are the same. And I think that this in part global that the young people see the uh, the chance of their career uh, advance or uh, upward mobility being taken away. So that make them uh, in that in that case, I, I would say it's probably universal, not just limited to Taiwan. Hong Kong. To characterize the ties uh, between young activists in Hong Kong and Taiwan, you mentioned the demonstration effect. I was wondering if there are specific ideas or tactics that each side borrowed from the other? Uh, I'll repeat my question again for Christina. Um, you mentioned about the demonstration effect um, between the Hong Kong and Taiwan social movements. Um, how would you characterize the ties between young activists in Hong Kong and Taiwan? And if there are certain ideas or tactics that each borrowed from the other? Yes, um, I think there's certainly uh, dem clear demonstration effects uh, for social movement in those two places. And I think uh, there's a growing tie between the social activists and civil society in these two places. Um, uh, I, I would say that the linkage between these Hong Kong and uh, Taiwan activists is, you know, uh, will be growing stronger and stronger. Uh, over time. And uh, as the demonstration in Hong Kong right now are uh, actually calling for more democracy and less interference from China. In fact, I think the, the Hong Kong and Taiwan links can be really traced back to the previous social movement that took place in 2014. Uh, for example, the banner wearing slogan like today Hong Kong, tomorrow Taiwan or or Taiwan, no Hong Kong nation were frequently spot in the student uh, led sunflower movement in Taiwan. So I think the uh, social movement that occurred uh, from 2014 to, to up to now has built a sense of uh, community between the activist group uh, in these two places. And the conversion of their discourse and their affirming strategy has really profoundly changed the political landscape in both places. Um, just to give a recent example, uh, in the 2000, uh, 2020, the Taiwanese media has featured a slogan like Taiwan, Hong Kong, we're together uh, in widely coverage media. And at one of the President Tsai's campaign rally, uh, when he run, uh, run for the uh, Taiwanese government, there were even Hong Kongers in a cr uh, crowd and shouting out, uh, liberated Hong Kong revolution of our time. And they also wearing uh, waving a black flag, flag. And many of the Taiwanese also join in the chain. So I think Taiwan's and Hong Kong's media also reported that several Hong Kong activists and legislators, they visit Taiwan to observe the 
election. And uh, I think that kind of echo what uh, uh, the legislator Freddie Lim has said uh, when he runs out for the campaign. So overall, I think there's a definitely uh, the rise of uh, local identity in both places. And I think the activist group, a civil society organization in both Hong Kong and Taiwan, they uh, draw lessons from each other and they will, uh, over time, their ties and connection will be grow stronger over time. Thank you. Um, Rose, we have a question for you uh, from our audience. Uh, it's from Ian Murphy, actually. He's an intern at GTI. Um, and he said, how can the U.S. government or U.S. firms protect journalistic freedom in Hong Kong and protect the journalistic integrity of reports coming out of Hong Kong? Oh. This is a very difficult question to answer. I think it's a, it's a depend on the different media outlets. It all depends on how the, uh, the, the company deal with this kind of a situation, whether they consider the principle uh, is the most important thing or the uh, interests of the company, especially the business interests is the most important thing. So if you ask whether the US company, they can uh, protect press freedom in Hong Kong, uh, it's not my role to answer that. My observation is I didn't see them did a lot. I think they're just using uh, 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 those uh, uh, contingent plan to, <laughs> to, to, to cope with the changes. And so, yeah, I'm not that optimistic about, I don't know how to answer this question. <laughs> and uh, yeah. It, I think it is this question for all the multinational uh, companies and also a lot of uh, elite universities in Hong Kong, in US, everywhere. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Um, we have another question from the audience. Um, um, this can be directed to Sophie. Uh, do you believe that the COVID-19 pandemic's effect on the global economies of the world, including Taiwan, will force movement to slow down our economic concerns. And this is from Tabitha Anderson. She's a research assistant at the International Institute for Strategic Studies. Jennifer, thanks for the question. Unfortunately, I missed part in the middle. Do you mind repeating it? Sure. This question is from Tabitha Anderson, she's a research assistant at the International Institute for Strategic Studies, she says, do you believe that the COVID-19 pandemic's effect on the global economies of the world, um, including Taiwan, will force social movements to slow down to give way to Okay, if I've understood the question correctly, I, I just big if, uh, I think the, the, the effects of COVID and on social movements is, is less about uh, economic status or, or the loss of economic opportunities. I, I mean, that will certainly uh, have material bearing, uh, but I think it's equally as much about people not being able to gather together, uh, travel and restrictions uh, being imposed or heightened on people's ability to assemble, particularly in large numbers. Uh, at the same time, you know, these kinds of any of these kinds of restrictions often drive a certain amount of social activism, you know, around the proximate issues, for example, people's ability to access health care or the ways in which, uh, you know, confinement may be arbitrary, that, that the restrictions that have been put on people's ability to interact or gather uh, may be overbroad, may not be sufficiently time bound. Uh, my colleagues uh, have put together a fairly lengthy Q&A about the relationship between COVID and public health emergencies and rights. Uh, from the perspective of international human rights law, it's on our website and I'd be happy to share that link with people if it's helpful. Thank you. Uh, just one follow up question. Um, you mentioned um, the linkages and growing solidarity between the Hong Kong, Tibet, Xinjiang uh, movements. And I was just wondering, you know, if um, the Chinese government can get away with um, its gross violations in Xinjiang, uh, do you think it could also get away with its policies in Hong Kong? 
because I think um, you know, the concern was also seeing what is the U.S. response uh, to its uh, recent policies in Hong Kong. So, do you think the world is seeing those issues um, in a similar matter, or 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 is it that you know there's much more concern for Hong Kong, um, and there's much greater you know international scrutiny on Chinese actions there? I think there is objectively more concern about Hong Kong, partly because it's been so visible. Uh, you know, there has been media able to you know cover every almost every aspect of it, unlike what's happened in Xinjiang. Uh, and because there are these kinds of international connections, there's a huge business community. There are very strong academic ties. But I think it was also the timing uh, of the t- the deteriorations in Hong Kong. And particularly in position of the NSL, you know, we we've spent the last couple of years, you know, raising grave concerns about what's happening in Xinjiang and making the point that if any other government in the world was arbitrarily detaining a million people on the basis of their ethnicity or their religion, that we would almost all, certainly already be well into an investigation, some kind of prosecution. But because it's China. And the Chinese government wields so much power within the UN system where any of the mechanisms through which justice could be pursued, it's very hard to make progress. You know, so that conversation is sort of well, already well underway alongside, you know, issues that I think have caused a lot of concern in the debate about Huawei, for example, the death of a Nobel Peace Prize winner in detention. You know, that, that I forget which of my fellow panelists mentioned earlier, changing perceptions of the Chinese government's agenda worldwide, and that's increasingly negative, uh, or, or that people are skeptical about its agenda. Uh, so I think the attention to Hong Kong, both on its own merits, but also as part of a continuum of overreach and abusive conduct by the Chinese government that's triggered uh, a, 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 at least a, an appropriate response. There's a lot more still to do, I think. I feel like we just started our conversation, but unfortunately this marks the end of our webinar today. Um, I want to thank our guest, Kino, uh, Freddie Lim, um, and all the panelists joining from Taiwan, Hong Kong, and the United States for their insights um, into recent developments in Hong Kong, um, and also the factors that bind social movements in Hong Kong and Taiwan together. Um, also, thanks to all the GTI staff and interns who made today's program possible. Um, the Hong Kong-Taiwan-China relationship will continue to be a key issue impacting social movements in both Hong Kong and Taiwan, um, as well as impacting the trajectory of identity politics, uh, which will in turn affect Beijing's um, Hong Kong policy and cross-street relations. Um, this is an issue that we hope to revisit again sometime in the future, and we hope that you continue to tune in into other virtual seminars hosted by GTI. Um, but thank you so much all for um, joining today and all our audience members for asking questions. Um, so stay safe and goodbye.